So we talked about uh, the impact of climate and humans on megafauna and uh, what can be inferred. This is a nice paper that just came out that actually looks at, looks at the modern uh, day human activities and how they are imprinted on non-human species uh, including many ev evolutionary aspects and then that kind of a relation is uh, applied to species back in time in the periods we are looking at in terms of hominin evolution. So I'm going to give it a very brief introduction. It's a very nice paper but I'm obviously not going to go into the details. I wanted to introduce the paper to you and give you a sense of what it is that is done and why this has obviously been an important player uh, during the co-evolution of humans and the non-human species along the way as well. So here we are looking at uh, human behavior or impact and non-human morphological evolution uh, in, in the examples that they have listed. So harvesting pressure, whether it's fisheries or hunting and gathering uh, and so on. So you can see that uh, trophy feature reduction. So there were many animals hunted for uh, their uh, fancy uh, horns, for example, uh, tusks, uh, ivories, and so on. And you can s we will see an example that sh shows that uh, trophy hunting actually uh, led to morphological change in terms of uh, the trophy feature reduction. And the fishing down the food web uh, kind of idea from uh, Daniel Polly of catching the big fish uh, has led to uh, a body size reduction. And there are details about these as to whether that's a genetic change or just a phenotypic change. So there may be a gene already for uh, sexual maturation of let's say sardines at 11 years of age, which would make them bigger and putting fishing pressure on those uh, large species eventually may begin to express uh, a genetic frequency that is uh, maturing at seven years of age and is smaller. So it's not necessarily a new species, it's just a phenotypic response. Uh, mortality changes are also seen because of fishing and so on and so forth. Uh, landscape modification with urbanization, uh, wildfire, fire management, etc. have led to wing shape changes and altered limb properties of various uh, birds and uh, amphibians uh, and so on. Translocation and extinction uh, obviously has also resulted in a limited gape for toxic prey avoidance. So uh, when you take a species that has evolved to deal with uh, predators uh, or it is predating on uh, prey and you uh, translocate or uh, drive some to extinction, then that is imprinted on uh, how the predator-prey interaction happens, smaller fruits and seeds uh, when species have been, uh, vegetative ecological species have been uh, moved. And as I mentioned somewhere in the course before, uh, Lake Victoria, which is often referred to as Darwin's Pond, because of its ama amazing evolutionary information. It's a nice enclosed uh, lake. Of course, Nile flows out of it and all kinds of water flows in, but it's a mesocosm that can be monitored. So fishing pressure and pesticides and other things had a huge impact on chicklets in Lake Victoria, and then regulation changes reduced the fishing pressure and uh, pollution, which has allowed some chicklets to uh, recover, but their behavior has changed over time as well compared to what their behavior was before uh, <coughs> the drop in population because of human activities. Domestication of uh, dogs, ca uh, cats, uh, horses, cattle, etc. Uh, have obviously, and chicken and so on, have uh, led to uh, even domestication of wild grasses uh, like corn, for example, have led to increased seed size and reduced horn and body size uh, and so on. So genetic modification, of course, we are doing lots of GMOs now and aqua 
uh, culture and so on. So accelerated growth rates are common and maybe soon we will have de-extinction happening because there are wild ideas being considered about uh, various species uh, being reconstructed from DNA, almost like a Jurassic Park kind of idea. Uh, whether that will happen and when it will happen is of course uh, still open. So <clears throat> selected modern examples of morpholo morphological change in response to human behavior. Uh, here uh, house finch, I'm just going to look at uh, the species and you can look at the various features, morphological features that have changed and the time period or which these are uh, recorded. So house finch, cliff swallow, gray jay, uh, anoli lizard, grasshoppers, fence lizard, purple loose strife, uh, uh, soapberry bug and palm seeds. Uh, so the time periods uh, here go uh, to early uh, 20th century and later 20th century and some very recent into the uh, 21st century. So beak lengths, wing lengths, wing pointedness, uh, limb length, uh, subdigital scale number, body mass, relative wing uh, length, hind limb length, uh, vegetative size for uh, purple loose strife, uh, mouth part size for some bugs and seed size for palm seeds and have all shown uh, what can be uh, quantified as uh, significant changes. Okay, so the present, uh, these are uh, uh, the activities we will see in the next uh, uh, slide here correspond to trophy hunting that we mentioned, net and trap fishing, habitat modification and urbanization which affects many species uh, including birds like sparrows, uh, hunting of course, angling, translocation of course, uh, intentional and unintentional for example, ballast waters and ships carry lots of uh, invasive species like Spartina uh, grass uh, from the Mediterranean to the Americas, uh, diseases like cholera, uh, fish, clams, and so on and so forth. Uh, plant harvesting, in invertebrate uh, harvesting, and deformation or habitat changes. So these are the magnitude uh, change in percentages shown by colors and evolutionary change per million years. So they are called Darwins, as you can imagine, which is a cute uh, terminology. So the presented magnitude of phenotype changes represent approximate percentages of difference from earliest measured value in these periods. The reported evolutionary rates in Darwin's per million years reflect the magnitudes of morpho morphological change, absolute value of the difference between uh, the natural log of the starting trait value and natural log of the ending trait value per million years. For cases with available morphological trait measurements, which excludes the elephant's elephant presence absence example, and information on the number of years over which the change occurred. For cases in which multiple phenotypes were analyzed, I think you have some idea about genotype and phenotype. Genotype is uh, what genes have uh, given you, like hair color, eye color, height, etc. Et and phenotype is how uh, the environment affects the expression of that gene. Um, okay, so I'll leave it there as brief. Um, multiple phenotypes were analyzed. The magnitude of change depicts the first listed phenotype. Only one uh, of multiple modern examples of these effects in different species of salmon and shellfish were included in the figure. So further example of these species uh, going to megafauna, African elephants, bighorn sheep, wild reindeer, American ginseng, plants, uh, Himalayan snow lotus, uh, grayling, uh, so uh, pink salmon, rock lobster, red uh, porgy, uh, sheephead, sole, volcano keyhole limpet, and marine snails. Again, various periods, various human activities, trophy hunting, uh, hunting, uh, harvesting, uh, fishing, uh, angling, uh, and so on. Uh, affected phenotypes again, uh, female tusklessness, male horn length, male body mass, uh, and so on and so forth. Fork length, body mass, shell length, etc. I won't go into the details, but 
global warming, for example, changes in temperatures, rainfall patterns also affect uh, sex selection in several amphibians, in wildebeests, uh, and so on and so forth, where existing uh, evolutionary traits are modified by human activities. For example, if human activities are producing greenhouse gases, which is leading to temperature, precipitation, humidity changes, and that influences sex ratio, then that can be attributed to uh, humans as well. So here again are the magnitude changes and the evolution rates in Darwin's. I won't go into the details, of course, but you can read uh, the paper. And here is a very cute example of how recovery happens. Evolutionary changes in big horn sheep, horn size responsible uh, in response to variable human trophy hunting pressures. Uh, so you can see that horn length in centimeters of four-year-old males, uh, trophy hunting targeting large male horn size, drove down the size. Here are the sample sizes. And as the tenfold decline of sport harvesting uh, started in 1996, there seems to be a recovery in the uh, uh, male horn size. So the debate also is, of course, how quickly species respond to selective pressures, in this case human activities, and uh, how quickly those uh, phenotypes return if the selection pressure is removed. Okay, Evolutionary changes in bighorn sheep, uh, as I said, box and kernel density plus of horn lengths of male four-year-old sheep from 1975 to 2012 at Ram Mountain, Alberta, Canada, where 2.26 male rams were uh, harvested per year from 1973 to 1995. So males are chosen because of the horn trophy hunting, uh, followed by a rate of only 0.27 rams per year from 1996 to 2011. Median values are represented by white circles, etc. indicate lower and upper quartiles. I won't go into those sorts of details, but this is the animal and you can see these are the trophy uh, that people want to own. Looking again at selected archaeological examples of morphological change in response to human behavior, now uh, going back in time, so we are going to our hominin uh, evolution time scales. The presented magnitudes of phenotypic change represent approximate percentages of difference from earliest measured value. The reported evolutionary rates in Darwin's reflect the magnitude of morphological change, absolute value of the difference between the natural log of the starting trait value and the natural log of the ending trait value per million years, or Darwin's. For cases which uh, in which multiple phenotypes were analyzed, magnitude of the change depicts the first listed uh, phenotype. Okay, So this is worth looking at because now we are in the range of 200,000 years to 11,000 years before present. So uh, going back to hominin uh, evolution time scales uh, to the end of the last uh, ice age, for example. Uh, other older times here, 120,000 year to 1,000 years. Uh, that's, those are the kind of the longest ones. So you can see what are we looking at? Spur thighed tortoise, Mediterranean limpet, conch, uh, giant owl limpet, uh, goat's eye limpet, uh, Urgenville's limpet, Cape turban sh uh, shell, coyotes, barley, maize, pumpkin, etc. And again, human activities here, invertebrate harvesting, hunting, uh, extinctions and domestication of the maize and pumpkins and barley and so on uh, with agriculture, but even before that, uh, going as far back as 10,000 years. Uh, we have talked about whether this was forced on humans by extinction of megafauna or uh, it was a selection based on something else. Uh, so affected phenotypes, uh, humeral shaft diameter, shell diameter, shell height, shell length, uh, operculum length, femur circumference, mandibular glacialization, you can look up what that is, uh, grain weight, 
uh, number of kernels per year and fruit diameter okay so you can see various magnitudes of change in percentages versus evolutionary change per million years okay I thought this is a cute paper and has direct relevance to what we are discussing in terms of human behavior and extinctions and evolution of non-human species so obviously there's been an interaction between hominin evolution climate human behavior non-human species human activity and so on which obviously continues and as we have mentioned before many people consider this period as uh, forcing a sixth mass extinction we have had five mass extinctions before which are considered natural uh, whereas we are now uh, imposing our uh, presence uh, in terms of changing conditions habitats temperatures precipitation etc so fast that many species cannot adapt uh, or we are killing many species as well so I'm going to leave it there all right